Thanks for joining us, you guys, today. Uh, as you guys could see from the title, from the description, the subject is going to be an audiobook. Um, we think that this is a very important audiobook and it's fairly short. So we wanted to have this available on YouTube for whoever wants to listen to it. Maybe you don't have time to read, you want to drive, whatever it is. So uh, we're we're going to put it here for you on the lion's den. Uh, Dioscoros, do you have anything to add? Yes, this is the first audiobook in hopefully what is going to be a long series of audiobooks. We want to cover historical things as well as theological things so that people can not just learn through, say, slideshow presentations and conversations, but specifically through being able to consume the material even when you're out and about and don't have time to physically read all right all right here we go we're gonna start we have it on the screen for you um let's see if we make make it bigger i don't does that show bigger for you guys or just for us you guys know i don't notice any difference from my side oh okay i don't know either well there's an audio book, so you don't have to read along. That's the whole point. So let's do it. So I'm going, this is, we're going to, uh, this is, by the way, the translation is by Dr. Sebastian Brock. Uh, and uh, we're going to skip the intro that he has. We're going to go straight into the translation. And then there's two parts. Eventually, the, the beginning is just kind of like a narration. And then it goes into two parts, the Orthodox bishops and the other bishops. So I'll take the part of the Orthodox bishops, and Dioscoros will take the other one. All right, yes. I'm going to I'm going to read the the narration the trans where the translation begins, and we'll get into it. All right, and then if it if it's didacted, if you guys can see the screen, it'll be either didacted or um, fragmented, whatever the word is, where they don't have the 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 portion; it's not available or an just so anybody knows, there is a Latin recension. We're going with the Syriac recension. Okay? So prepared at their hands. Along with it, he also gave the statement which the bishops made after they went up to the capital. And the bishops were urging that those documents be read in the presence of him, Justinian, and the state officials who were there. But the emperor put off the matter, saying, I will read them when I have time. With this speech, the second meeting ended. After a certain number of days, there arrived at the capital the bishops from the opposing faction who had been summoned by the emperor. Their names are as follows. Hypatius of Ephesus, Stephen of Isaurian Seleucia, Innocentius of Amornia, John of Vizu. These two towns are in Thrace, and Anthemus of Trebizond. The emperor sent them the document of the statement which the orthodox bishops had given him. He also sent it to the holder of the see of the capital. His intention was that they should read and examine it minutely and prepare themselves for discussion. After this, the order came for the two parties to assemble in the hall known as Bet Hormizdis, which is today joined to the palace. There, the discussion was to take place in the presence of the Sinekeloi of the holder of the patriarchal throne of the capital, seeing that he himself did not come. 
strategist, the patrician, was allocated to listen to the discussion and report on the developments to the emperor. He took the place of magistros. When they had assembled and sat down facing each other, Hypatius began turning over his usual old inities, blaming the blessed Dioscoros for accepting the wicked Eutyches at the Second Synod of Ephesus. It is the custom of the upholders of, of the heresy of Nestorius to collect together empty complaints against the Orthodox Fathers since they cannot make a defense for their own flimsy teachings. They hope to cover up their own wicked beliefs and not let them be examined by means of calumnies against the saints. The Orthodox bishops, however, were well aware of their opponents' cunning, how by inviting them to make a defense for the blessed Dioscoros, they would go on to accuse them of the heresy of Eutyches. Accordingly, the Orthodox bishops began by anathematizing Eutyches, and having thus thrown off from themselves any suspicion of the heresy of Eutyches, a suspicion that their opponents wanted to bring upon them, having ended off from themselves this calumny, the Orthodox bishops began to fight on behalf of the blessed Dioscoros, showing how Eutyches had submitted a libellus in which he acknowledged the Orthodox faith, anathematizing Valentinus, Valentinus who says that our Lord brought his own body down from heaven, acknowledging to the teaching of the fathers and accepting the creed of Nicaea, and that it was only after this that Dioscoros had accepted him. The opposing bishops say Dioscoros was negligent in not requiring Eutyches to confess that the word was of the same nature as us in the flesh. The Orthodox bishops say, the blessed Dioscoros was satisfied by the Acta at Constantinople, where Eutyches agreed to confess that God the Word was of the same nature as us in the flesh. The opposing bishops say, what was said only hesitatingly is not a clear confession. For this reason, it was all the more necessary for Dioscoros to make exact inquiry of Eutyches concerning the term of the same nature, homoousios. And then they enlarged on the matter, saying, Dioscoros neglect over exactitude is a betrayal of the faith, and he who neglects even one small item from matters that are obligatory is subject to censures and serious punishments. The Orthodox bishops said, Reserve those words and the discussion of them for the proper time, but now tell us, do you hold the blessed Dioscoros to be a heretic? The opposing bishops say, We do not hold him to be a heretic, for his opinions were orthodox, but he was neglectful in matters of urgent importance. After this, they added other lines of argument, saying that the synod at Chalcedon had met every usefully on the matter of Eutyches. With this, the first day's session was dissolved. Other things were discussed there too, about ordinations, on these, the Orthodox bishop said that the ordinations which were transmitted from the Synod of Chalcedon were confirmed by true faith and by communion with the Orthodox. The next day, they gathered again, and first of all, the Orthodox bishops asked that what was said might be taken down in writing, just as they had asked the previous day, without success. The opposing bishops did not accept this, not did the locum tenens for the magistro saying i did not receive any such authorization from the serene emperor the orthodox bishops asked for the statement they had given to the emperor to be read they straight away provided a copy and it was read out afterwards they asked the opponents saying say if you have anything you find fault with in this statement the opposing bishops replied we hold a moderate opinion about it and they returned a question to the Orthodox bishops. Tell us if what is in the statement is all you have to find fault with the synod that gathered at Chalcedon. The Orthodox bishops said, that is not all. We have many more things to censure in the synod. But above all else, the fact that they, they accepted Ibas, and again that they accepted him on the basis of his letter to Mari the Persian, which they accepted, when it was read out before them, despite its being full of every wickedness, and on its basis they held Ibas to be orthodox. They also accepted the wicked Theodoret, 
without his having changed from his evil belief, and they gave him back the priesthood too. The opposing bishop said, redacted, Cyril received him, redacted, because he made a union with the Orientals. They further added, the synod accepted Theodoret with greater exactitude than they did the Holy Cyril. The Orthodox bishop said, first of all, along with the entire Castern Synod, ever since the blessed Cyril also accepted Theodoret before he had yet been deprived of his priesthood. This on the grounds that he held the same opinions as the Orientals and gave utterance to them. And as someone who had removed himself from his utter wickedness. Then after this, the Orthodox bishop said, at that time, the wicked heresy of Nestorius was gaining strength and was destroying the souls of men, with the result that the bishops of the entire Eastern diocese did not want to sign the deposition of Nestorius, and so there was a danger that the greater portion of the world would be filled with the harm brought about by Nestorius' wickedness. For this reason, the blessed Cyril, like a wise doctor in an emergency, accepted all the bishops of the Diocese of the Orient, even if it was without going into details exactly, once they had acknowledged that Nestorius had been deposed by them from the priesthood, and they themselves had given an orthodox profession of faith. He did not consider Theodora as a case where the malady was mingled in with and joined to the entire body. So afterwards, when he learned that he had remained in his teachings that were hateful to, five lines lost, Theodore, and he reminded John that Theodore needs reprimands from you. Then after a certain time, the synod at Chalcedon took place, and when the Orthodox faith had been established through the grace of God, and while all peoples everywhere were rejecting the wicked heresy of Nestorius, with the result that Theodoret too of evil name was ejected from the priesthood because of his failure to repent of his wickedness. It was at that point that the synod at Chalcedon received him without trial, thus putting itself under just condemnation. How are those who received him not guilty of his wickedness since he had, since when he had anathematized Nestorius alone, they did not go on to require him to anathematize his wicked writings, which he wrote against the Holy Cyril and against the true faith. The opposing bishops were put to shame by these words and kept silence, whereupon the Orthodox bishops reverted to the discussion of the wicked Ibas, and they read from the Acta of the Synod of Chalcedon the declaration of Pascan Pascasinus the bishop of the Church of Rome. In this declaration, they said in brief that on the basis of the letter that it had been read out, Ibas was orthodox. The orthodox bishops then asked the magistrates to allow the letter to be read. He did so, and the letter of the wicked Ibas addressed to Mari the Persian was read out. Three and a half lines lost. Because they did not endure the wicked things in it, in reply, the opposing bishops could not find neither defense nor evidence of forgery. Rather, they renounced the praxis, saying, this did not take place at Chalcedon. <laughs> and they demanded that the Orthodox bishops demonstrate that it did. At this, the Orthodox bishops laughed and said, whence else can you show the that the synod at Chalcedon took place except from what was written there? documents that are to be found all over the world. A great argument was stirred up over this, and the opposing bishops held out their denial. The Orthodox bishop said to them, Tell us now whether you accept the letter of Ibas. The opposing bishops were put out by this too, and said, We do not accept what was wrongly said in it. In retort, the Orthodox Bishop said, Then in the case of Nestorius or any other heretic, you hold it is only necessary to reject what is wrongly said and no more. It was in vain, it seems, that the all-wise fighters for the mysteries of the, of the church anathematized the heretics, and that the latter said a few things that were not wrong, but which are worthy of acceptance. As to your saying that the praxis did not take place at Chalcedon concerning 
lost. Anathematize everyone who accepts the letter of Ibas. Four, lost. The anathema will not transgress against the synod at Chalcedon, seeing that this praxis did not take place there as you assert. The opposing bishop said, we will not do this. By their refusal to anathematize the letter of Ibas, they testified that this praxis did take place, but they were unable to offer any defense for this manifest wickedness, with the result that the shame of their denial was apparent to the auditor and to all those who were present. When all these things had been said on this topic, they came to the examination of the faith. The opposing bishops read the letter of the Oriental bishops that had been written to the Blessed Cyril concerning the agreement with him. Following this, the letter of the all-wise Cyril, which took the form of a reply to the Orientals, was read out. The Orthodox bishop said, We acknowledge that we accept both letters in accordance with the understanding of the wise teacher. They then requested, saying, We have in our possession letters of the blessed Cyril, one addressed to Enlogius and another to the blessed Akakius, bishop of Melitene. Let them be read out too. Before they were read, the opposing bishop said, We do not accept for purposes of ecclesiastical law those things which were not confirmed by the synod. The Orthodox bishops held up the dis discussion and demanded that this be put in writing and that the opposing bishops should say openly that they do not lost, which was written Cyril after the synod at Ephesus lost for these things were not confirmed by the synod and according to their word they necessarily hold them not to be accepted then the orthodox bishops introduced gregory the theologian who called the law of the orthodox all that had been written by athanasius the great fighter in support of religious doctrine despite the fact that these works had not been confirmed by the synod since the father and teacher cyril had likewise aided the truth his letter to eulogius was read once its contents had been seen the orthodox bishop said we are of like opinion and we acknowledge the single nature of god the word incarnate and we do not divide up the single christ after the union into a duality of natures even though we recognize their difference the orthodox bishops also wanted the letter of akakius of melatine to be read out but the auditor checked them much of the day has already passed, and he said it is altogether equivalent in its sense to that addressed to Eulogius. The opposing bishops said, we too will introduce the Holy Fathers and show that they spoke of two natures with reference to Christ. The Orthodox bishops pressed them, saying, show us the God-clothed fathers who use these words and said, that it is right to call Christ two united and in separate natures after the union, just as we have ourselves shown that they taught that after the union, it is right to speak of only a single nature of God, the word incarnate. The, orth the opposing bishops promised, we will show this tomorrow. The Orthodox bishops asked that the emperor should not of the conversations from one of the sides only, as had happened the previous day, but that this should take place with both sides present. They promised that this should be so, thereupon the session was dissolved. The opposing bishops, spurning the just request that the Orthodox bishops had made at the end of the evening session, went into the emperor on their own and informed him of what they chose to tell him. Moreover, the next day, without having yet provided the testimonies of the Holy Fathers, which they had promised, indeed, they could not have done so. They came together to the emperor and sent for the Orthodox bishops to come too. They came and the emperor asked them, what are you doing? They replied, by means of the statement supplied by us to your majesty and by means of what has arisen in the two days discussion, we have dispelled the opinion, which it seems some people held of us, that we do not think in an orthodox fashion. The emperor, the said, emperor said, 
I am not of the opinion either that you do not think in an orthodox fashion, but you do not want to communicate out of except excessive scrupulous detail and because of certain names which have been put on the diptychs. The orthodox bishops asked if they could give an account of what had arisen in the course of the previous two days' discussions, for they wanted lost. You agreed with each other. I do not want to learn what arose between you in the dialogue. So he was unwilling to listen to their account of the discussion. He demanded of them, saying, Because you have not been able to come to an agreement, but have left the division without any solution and the schism without any healing, go off with those appointed by me to the archbishops of Rome or of Alexandria and Antioch and Jerusalem and ask them concerning the faith. The Orthodox bishops declined to undertake the journey to the above-mentioned holders of seas on the grounds of old age and weakness of body. They added, in conclusion, there is no propriety in our going to those who hold the opposite view to our own and asking them about the faith. The emperor said, then suggest some means so that the union of all the patriarchs can be achieved or go yourselves to them. The Orthodox bishops say, the divine canons do not allow us, insignificant bishops, in small towns, to provide any common statement on the faith. Moreover, in the statement that we have provided and in the dialogue we have held at the emperor's orders, we do not speak for the church as a whole, but we have simply made clear the liberty of our faith as we have said. The emperor made the same demands, requiring them either to go to the holders of the other sees or to suggest some means of union. The Orthodox bishops made further excuses on grounds of the canons, propriety, and feebleness of body. After this, the emperor asked them, tell me if you are in communion with the Archbishop of Alexandria. The Orthodox bishops say, if that the Archbishop of Alexandria remains in the Orthodox faith, then we embrace communion with him. The opposing bishops who were there demanded that they should sudden should say openly if they were in communion with the Archbishop of Alexandria in the same way as they themselves openly confess they are in close communion with the Archbishop of Rome. The Orthodox bishop said everyone who confesses the Orthodox faith and who, on the other hand, anathematizes alien and foul doctrines, who says that God the Word was incarnate and that he suffered for us in the flesh, that is by nature subject to suffering and death, that he suffered of his own will, both sufferings that are natural and not in dispute, and death, everyone who distinguishes the time before the cross and that after the resurrection. With such a man, we are in communion. Now, the bishops thought and were of the opinion that if the emperor asked them about the archbishop in Alexandria, they should reply in a moderate way, judging and considering that this was the most advantageous course for the subject under consideration. The rest is lost. Um, on the church, and this was the cause of our departure, were given to us all to put our... Oh, no, we, we, we skipped the, the thing. Page. Oh, yeah, right here. The next page, yep. Okay. From what the Orthodox Bishop said in the presence of the Emperor Justinian, when they were summoned by him to make an apologia concerning the true faith and to suggest a way by which the churches might be united, the bishops are as follows. Sergius of Cyrus, Peter of Rashain, Thomas of Germanica, Thomas of Dara, John of Tella. When the emperor blamed them for leaving their cities without due cause, they told him a new sentence has come on the church, and this was the cause of our departure. For the libellists were, were given to us all to put our signatures to, libelli in which we were required to anathematize ourselves and those who were our fathers, and indeed more or less the entire world. For to anathematize Peter, Archbishop of Antioch, and all who remain in communion with him, and Achacius of Constantinople, and Peter of Alexandria, as well as those who preserve in communion, 
persevere in communion with them. This is nothing other than to anathematize ourselves and, as it were, everything under the sky. When they had openly shown forth their true faith in the presence of the bishops whom the emperor had brought to discuss with them and in the presence of the state officials who were listening and stated that the fathers taught us to confess a single nature of the incarnate word after the union, then they said to the opposing party, show us the God-clothed fathers who used the words after the union. Uh, we should call the one Christ two natures united or inseparable in the same way that we have shown that they taught that it is right to acknowledge one nature of God the Word incarnate after the Union. The opposing party said that they would show this, but they failed to do so. Then the Emperor tells the Orthodox that because they had not agreed to what the diptychs, to the Diophysites said, they should go again or now to the Patriarch of Rome and of Antioch and of Jerusalem and offer them arguments or provide some means for the peace of the churches. They, the then, they then pressed them to suggest some means themselves by which it might be both fitting and possible to achieve the peace of the holy churches. Under so, this pressure... Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. was on the other side. Yeah, yeah. Okay. The Orthodox bishops say the canon does not allow... Uh, I can't see the word there because of the stream yard duck. What is it saying? Uh, the the mm -mm. Canon those who have specifically withdrawn themselves from communion with the opposite party. This one? No. Um, the Orthodox bishops say the canon does not allow five insignificant bishops, bishops moreover of small oh. towns, to provide any common yeah. statement on the faith by themselves. When they ask the emperor if they might if they might be dismissed to their homes, literally places, the emperor said, put down in writing that you will not make any ordinations and that you will not baptize or give the sacrament to anyone apart from those who are with you. They refused to put this in writing, saying it would be an insult to the emperor if we were to agree with him in writing to the situation that he had ordered. The emperor then said, in that case, let each of you say that he will not do any of these things, then you can go. Otherwise, you will be dismissed to Zog Zogma. They replied, the divine laws do not allow priests to use oaths, nor can any man transgress an imperial order without danger. The emperor said, either bring Severus to suggest some means for the peace of the churches, or suggest one yourselves. They said, we do not know where the holy Severus is. Then they pressed them to suggest some means themselves by which it might be both fitting and possible to achieve the peace of the holy churches. Under this pressure, the Orthodox bishop said, we do not think that those who have specifically withdrawn themselves from communion with the, opposed, with the opposite party will be united unless they anathematize those who speak of two natures after the inexplicable union, as well as the Tome of Leo and what took place at Chalcedon in opposition to the Orthodox faith. They were silent, however, for the moment, about any anathema of particular names out of consideration for the accomplishment of universal union. The bishops also said this, first of all, the libelli of the Romanoi must come to an end, to which all the bishops today holding sees have put their signature. Such was the advice of the Orthodox bishops if ways were to be found of achieving the peace of the churches. The emperor objected to this and said, would the following conditions perhaps be acceptable to them? They might anathematize Diodor, Theodore, Theodoret, Ibas, Nestorius, and Eutyches, and accept the 12 chapters of the Holy Cyril while anathematizing what had been written against them. They might confess one nature of God the Word incarnate, but they should refrain from anathematizing those who speak of two natures after the inexpressible union, anathematizing instead those who hold Nestorian views and divide up Christ into two natures, while confessing as a crafty device which they had discovered long ago, together with the other side, the two united and inseparable natures, they should accept the synod at Chalcedon as far as 
the expulsion of Eutyches was concerned, but they need not accept the definition of faith made there. They should cease their anathema of the tome of Leo, and the labelli of the Romanoi should not be suspended. These things failed to persuade the Orthodox. The bishops whom the emperor had brought to speak with the Orthodox bishops are as follows. Hypatius of Ephesus, Stephen of Isaurian Seleucia, uh, Innocentius of Amorium, John of Bizi. The towns of these two are in Thrace and Anthemus of Trebizond. These men found fault with Dioscoros because he was not sufficiently attentive to details in matters of the reception of Eutyches, failing to examine him on the matter of his faith carefully on every point, as is right that everyone should be attentive to all the tricks of the heretics, but they had no complaint against Dioscoros in matters of faith. Uh, I think that's the, that's the end of the translation. Yes, that's the end of the translation. Would you like to give your preliminary thoughts on it now that the people have heard it? Sure. So for anyone who doesn't know, this is happening after the Hinoticon era, after the Labellus era, before 553, before 536. This is in 532. So um, Severus is in exile in Egypt. Justinian eventually brings him to Constantinople four years after this because he, he's really trying, he's pushing for this reconciliation. So notice the five bishops on each side. Um, we read, I think, the Syriac ones uh, and the, the Byzantine ones. So uh, here you see Anthemus of Trebizond. Eventually, Anthemus of Trebizond becomes uh, Anthemus of Constantinople, Patriarch of Constantinople, and he switches sides. He After St. Severus meets with him. St. Severus meets with him in 536, and he convinces him of orthodoxy, and Anthemus switches sides and he's canonized in our churches today. So, uh, and Anthemus is, um, intends to put ju with Justinian's I, like um, motivation and, and auspices. He, he wants to uh, have a synod in Constantinople in 536 where Anthemus presides, and then that becomes the faith of the empire, but Pope Agapetus of Rome was there, and so that's not what happened. The opposite happened. So, uh, but the point is, um, Anthemus of Constantinople, one of the five apologists of the Chalcedonians, switches and, be and joins the other side. And this is probably the starting point, because he probably, most likely, hadn't really encountered the apologetical side of the Oriental Orthodox, because this was after the era of the Labellus of Hormizdas that they reference, where every all of the true bishops were kicked uh, out of their sees. They were forced out by the by imperial force, and so Saint Anthemus here, he's now, I guess you could say, he's now encountering what the arguments for the Orthodox side are, and really, the Chalcedonians were absolutely lost here, and. Dr. Brock speaks about how the Syriac recension of these minutes are in conformity with the Latin Chalcedonian recension of them. Um, not, neither side recorded quite everything that happened, but the details coincide with each other such that we can tell they are faithfully trying to transcribe the events. Uh, now, we see that they talk about multiple things. They talk about the letter of Ebos, and we see that the opposing bishops, the, the heretical ones, they make up crazy ex excuses. So the, the term praxis just means the act, like the act of accepting the letter of Ebos. First, they say the act, that action didn't happen at Chalcedon. And then they show, they show like, not only did it happen at Chalcedon, but the only way to show that anyone accepted the letter was Cal is Chalcedon. There's no other document to provide except the acts of Chalcedon. And so they, they then make up various other excuses and such that they have to give the really bad excuse of saying, well, we accept 
or in implicitly saying that they accept the parts that aren't heretical, saying we reject the parts that are heretical, which is, of course, absurd. Because once you say that about someone like Nestorius, you can say, oh, yeah, Nestorius's writings are orthodox, except for all of those heretical bits, you know, and that's obviously not how the Holy Fathers thought about heretics. We also see that when the Emperor Justinian, he kind of knows what he's doing. But it's ironic that he himself says that he's willing for both sides to agree to anathematizing the persons, not just of Diodor and Theodore, but also of Theodoret and Ibas, their persons, not just their writings. Um, but he also had some heterodox, uh, I guess you could say, criteria in there, such as um, not anathematizing the Tome of Leo or accepting Chalcedon even as if it had any authority, even if it's just its authority to reject Eutyches. But that itself implies that Chalcedon has any authority and isn't a synod of heretics, which it was. And we see that the Orthodox bishops were very wise in responding in a way that they were willing to let the Chalcedonians retain as much of their stuff as possible, but that they still had to anathematize the bare minimum in order to convert to Oriental Orthodoxy. And that was, they need to get rid of the Libellus of Hormizdas, first and foremost, because that's the biggest, um, I guess you could say, log in the eye. And then, in addition to that, all they have to do is anathematize those who confess two natures after the Union, just like Saints Akakius and Cyril, who are mentioned, by the way, in their correspondences is mentioned in the minutes, they have to anathematize two natures after the Union, just like the saints did. And in addition to that, they have to anathematize the Tome of Leo. That's all they have to do, because those are all of the central points that, uh, that block the Chalcedonians from becoming Oriental Orthodox. They have to do just those three things. So notice, notice there's another few, a few highlights here. Um, Dioscoros, nobody said he's a heretic at this point. Justinian, when they asked him, and not the, the Chalcedonian bishops, no one is saying Dioscoros is a heretic at this point in Chalcedonian history. Number one. Number two, um, it said that the Chalcedonians' uh, priesthood is valid at this time, in the time of that this is happening, because of communion with the Orthodox. Uh, doesn't and, doesn't it say in a footnote somewhere of the opposite though that they it says that the that the Orthodox bishops were saying afterwards that the Holy Spirit had ceased descending upon their baptisms. Right. This is uh, so. Sorry. Let me let me clarify. In this conversation they're talking about around the time of chalcedon right when they're referring to the last 80 years before them but maybe by this time now in the in 532 by this time they're probably not recognizing it anymore but they're saying they recognized it in the time when chalcedon was happening yes you know? yeah that yeah that conforms to history because Really, shortly after Chalcedon, you have a bunch of bishoprics admitting that it's heretical. Like you have, what's his name? Amphilochius of Sida, who attended Ephesus 431, and then I believe Ephesus 430, 449, and then right. Chalcedon 451, who wrote a letter to the emperor, um, basically saying like yeah i shouldn't have accepted chalcedon i did this under pressure imperial pressure and this i completely reject it and so that this is one example but then you have of course the honoricon era which mm -hmm. really what it did was it converted chalcedonians into effective non-chalcedonian orthodox christians yeah so, and then uh, notice when the Orthodox wanted to read the letters of Cyril, 
the non-Orthodox didn't allow them to. They said they no, only allowed him to read the letter to Eulogius. Eulogius which, and to uh, Akakis, Akakis Amility. They so, didn't let him read the the latter one, though. Yeah. Um, they only re let him they read the, the former one. They didn't let. It was eventually that they got it, it through, but they weren't. They didn't want it to. So they didn't let them read them. And they said, why? And they said, because we didn't accept them via the council, so we can't read them. And they're like, what are you talking about? Athanasius letters, we didn't accept them via the councils, but we read them. Right? Yeah, and then and they used St. Gregory the Theologian to show that St. Athanasius' writings are the law, even yeah. though they were not specifically confirmed. Yeah, exactly. So then it shows what they're scared of reading the fathers and Cyril. And then when they said, okay, we want to read the fathers showing two natures after the, or we, we actually, I think we asked them, um, sh show us from the father saying two natures after the union. It never comes up. They never show it. Did we read the whole thing, by the way? Because they never brought up St. Dionysius, the Areopagite. We, ne we never got to that part. And I remember that's a distinct part of it. I don't think we read the whole thing. Is there a longer version of this? Well, I'm thinking about the... I mean... This I is know. the whole thing that I have. Yeah, but I distinctly remember that... You know what? Maybe it's just in... It's probably just in the Latin recension because Hypatius brings up, after they bring up St. Dionysius the Areopagite, Hypatius rejects it as an Apollinarian forgery. Really? Either Apollinarian for he rejects it as a forgery. I don't know if it was specifically as an Apollinarian forgery, but he definitely rejected it as a forgery. Um, because the the Orthodox bishops they basically give a list of examples of one nature after the union, and Saint Dionysius the Areopagite is one of them. Now, that is the first time that the Chalcedonians had to encounter St. Dionysius and the guy Hypatius calls it a forgery. You, so you can see that they, they want to ignore everything as a forgery, and either as a forgery or as not binding. So, for instance, they can't call the letters of St. Cyril as forgeries, but they want to delimit them from what is canonically binding and let me look it up um it's probably just the the latin recension and that one isn't um translated i remember reading from what's his name the the lutheran guy who became a melkite and is a scholar pelican pelican who is not actually a pelican by the way um pelican speaks so about in his prologue the St. Dionysius about this, if anyone wants to read about it. Yeah, I don't see it. I don't see it in this uh, recension. Um, yeah, it's not. It's. It, I, I guess it's not. It's. That's yeah. fine. Um. Yeah. We. As. Do you know if the Latin recension has the non-Chalcedonian bias like this one does? No, it's it's a Chalcedonian bias. It's I recorded by innocent. Yeah, I thought so. Okay. Yeah, and, and that's why it's important that these coincide with each other. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's it's very important. Uh, I'm not sure why Alcedonians don't care, of, it seems, about the details of, of, the, of this history. It's important to see um, from an unbiased perspective. I don't even know what the appeal is of being kind of like this Byzantine imperialist. I don't even think they're making their decision off of real theology and history i think they're making their decision off of either they were protestant and it's easier for their brains to understand two natures because protestants are also kind of historian and then um or they just have this affinity and romanticism with the roman empire so i don't yeah i don't know it's what it is in my opinion and you can kind of see this with how justinian is formulating it and kind of how Chalcedonians tend to argue throughout history is they want to put on the good image of never 
having to have repented of, say, Chalcedon or Second Constantinople. And so what you assent to and what you anathematize and all of this, it doesn't have to be for them a doctrinally consistent picture. So, for instance, professing one nature after the union is allowed for Justinian to us, but at the same time, we have to lift our anathema off of the Tome of Leo, which says that you absolutely cannot speak of one nature after the union. So Justinian doesn't care about being consistent. He just cares about putting on a good image that you can pretend is being consistent from Ephesus to Chalcedon to now, but it's not actually consistent. It's just, it's kind of like, in Islam, when they say, yes, the Torah, the Injil, and the Quran, we accept all of it. This is the one consistent narrative of Allah. But they, when it comes to actually acknowledging that this and that parts of the Torah or the Injil contradict the Quran, then they start to go into the, well, when we say we accept the Injil and the Torah, we only mean it in that the way it was originally revealed is accepted. But, you know, there must have been some corruptions since the Apostle Paul. And then they start making excuses for why their pretty picture, which they wish to maintain, can't stand up to scrutiny. That's right. Okay. Um, is there anything you want to add? Should we wrap it up? Do we have any questions? Uh, maybe I, I'd, I'd yeah. like to answer questions. If you have any questions, send them over. Yes, absolutely, Ann. You're 100%. By the way, something I want to mention while people are still writing their questions is I want to make a sort of series on different periods of history and Christology. So the next presentation that I want to produce is going to be on the Council of Nicaea. So ignore the Council of Ephesus and just focus on everything before that from about the time of Nicaea to show that what had later happened at the Council of Ephesus was nothing but a repetition of the Council of Nicaea to show that the Council of Nicaea itself alone is sufficient enough to refute diophysitism as being rejected. So. Mm. Absolutely. And then we'll move on to like Ephesus and the Council of Ephesus being accepted in, you know, the various geographies and how they accepted it as a refute as a rejection and refutation of diophysitism. All right. And then look out, guys, for this evening. Uh, I have another stream with um, Servant of Christ and Agen. Uh, we'll complete the one we started yesterday and pray for us. God bless, uh, like, subscribe, comment, do all of that stuff. And all right, take care, everybody.